Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning for Winship Grand Rounds. If you are an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive a CME credit hour for attending today, the login information can be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send Julie Hawkins an email or drop a note via the chat feature. This morning, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Ming Lim as our guest lecturer for Winship Grand Rounds. Dr. Ming Lim is an associate professor in the Division of Hematology and Hematologic Malignancies at University of Utah. She earned her medical degree at Cambridge University in England and completed a two-year foundation training in the United Kingdom. She then completed residency in internal medicine at Mayo Clinic Rochester and fellowship uh, in hematology at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. That's where I had the good fortune of meeting Dr. Lim and I've had the pleasure of knowing her uh, and following her career since then. Her clinical interests lie in the field of hemostasis and thrombosis and research interests are focused on complications affecting patients with congenital bleeding disorders, specifically hemophilia patients with inhibitors. She's the recipient of two foundation sponsored grants to determine the epidemiology and risk factors for inhibitor development in non-severe hemophilia. She has co-authored over 40 peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Lim is a medical director of the Utah Center for Bleeding and Clotting Disorders at University of Utah Health. And nationally, she serves on the American Board of Internal Medicine Hematology Approval Committee, is the chair of the American Society of Hematology Subcommittee on Stewardship and Systems-Based Hematology, and also serves on the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network, Cancer-Associated Thromboembolic Disease Panel. And we welcome Dr. Lin and looking forward to hearing her presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kempton, for the very kind introduction. And also thank you for inviting me to present today on a topic that's near and dear to me, which is on non-severe hemophilia A, often overlooked but not forgotten. Um, I'm just going to share briefly my disclosures here, where I have received honorarium for participation in the ASH study section, as well as the American Board of Internal Medicine Longitudinal Approval Committee, as well as honorarium for participation advisory board in, the, in this following uh, drug companies, of which nothing will be uh, discussed about them today. So for my agenda, I would like to start with talking about how common, what's the prevalence of non-severe hemophilia A, what is their known bleeding phenotype? What is their mortality and causes of death as well as life expectancy? And then to end it, to talk about their age-related comorbidities, which includes inhibitor development and cardiovascular diseases. So this audience probably needs no introduction, but very briefly, hemophilia A is an X-linked bleeding disorder that results from a decrease or deficiency in plasma clotting factor eight. Typically, the severity of hemophilia, we define it based on the degree of the clotting factor deficiency with levels of less than 1% as severe, um, levels between 1% to 5% as moderate, and levels greater than 5% and below 40% as mild hemophilia. The severity and frequency of bleeding in hemophilia typically correlates with the degree of the clotting factor deficiency as shown in this table here, where in the severe hemophilia A, they have spontaneous bleeding in joints and muscle, and then in the moderate and mild hemophilia, they rarely get spontaneous bleeding, but typically bleed with <clears throat> provocative procedures such as minor trauma or surgery. So if we start to look at the prevalence, the most recent data from national patient registries in three high income countries, basically the UK, Canada and France, they calculated that the pool estimate for the prevalence at birth was about 24.6 cases per 100,000 male births for hemophilia A. And then of this, for severe hemophilia A, they make up 9.5 cases per 100,000 male births. And then so given these two estimates, we calculated that for non-severe hemophilia A, it's about 15.1 cases per 100,000 male births. So given these estimates, it seems that non-severe hemophilia A account for more than half of the overall male hemophilia A population. If you now look at the prevalence in US and globally, the United States has um, our C CDC, which maintains a surveillance program and estimated that of the 1,600 hemophilia A males in the country, about 50.1% have non-severe hemophilia A. 
these numbers, these proportions are pretty much in line with real-world numbers that are reported by the World Federation of Hemophilia based on their annual global survey data, where they have collected data from about 175,000 males from over 125 countries. Even so, um, the numbers are in line. It is worth noting that this prevalence percentages varies between countries depending on their income level where in the high-income countries, non super hemophilia A contribute to about 53.6%, whereas this figure is much lower, about one-third in lower middle and um, poorer income countries. And the, suggest the thought process is that this discrepancy is due to differences in diagnostic practices and also uh, inadequate laboratory facilities in resourcing the countries. Yet, Despite this high prevalence of non severe hemophilia A among the hemophilia A population, this patient population have received uh, very little clinical and research attention because there's this assumption that they have a lower mortality, lower mor uh, morbidity as compared with their severe counterparts. And then much of the clinical management of how we manage patients with non severe hemophilia A is pretty much extrapolated from the severe hemophilia A population However, it's worth noting that despite their mild phenotype, there is a clinical need to increase awareness in this patient population, which is uh, the reason why I want to present this topic today. Since this patient population do experience considerable bleeding events, mortality, and age-related comorbidities. So I, I mentioned earlier when we were discussing um, the bleeding, where non-severe hemophilia A generally only suffer bleeding after provocative events, such as trauma and surgery. And so the information on the burden of disease, their bleeding phenotype in non-severe hemophilia A is, is much more limited. In, in the hemophilia population, when we discuss frequency of bleeding, we use a standardized term called the annual bleeding rate, which is uh, the ABR. And this is how we categorize um, someone's bleeding rate based on um, how many joint bleeds they have or how many non-traumatic or spontaneous bleed they have in a year. And in, in several studies that I've shown in this table um, that's come from national registries from different countries, they have found that in the non-severe hemophilia A population, the mean or median ABR, the annual bleeding rate, ranges from 0 0.5 to about 3 um, per year. And, and it, of course, it depends on the severity of disease where moderate hemophilia have a higher mean, about 3.2, and um, mild hemophilia have a much lower mean ABR, which is to be expected. And then for comparison, I show here in the bottom row, the, uh, a national registry from Austria, just to show you what the median ABR would be for severe hemophilia A. And it ranges widely because depending on whether a patient's on prophylaxis or not, it ranges from 28 um, and bleeding rates per year, uh, bleeding episodes per year to about 4.9 with prophylaxis. So it's clear from here that the bleeding phenotype in a non-severe hemophilia A population is definitely much lower. But if you look at ranges, the range here or, or the interquartal uh, range, there are some individuals that do have high ABR similar to a severe hemophilia A population. So take for instance this um, study by Betty et al. from the United Kingdom. The median ABR is 0 0.5 with a range of 0 to 4.5. But you can see if you look at the frequency of bleeding in their population, even though the median ABR was 0 0.5, there is a skewness in the distribution of the bleeding episodes where a quarter of patients had an ABR of greater than one, which highlights the fact that even though we know that the non severe hemophilia A population has a milder bleeding phenotype, some of these individuals have a high burden of disease that does require attention and appropriate management similar to our severe hemophilia A population. And now we're going to talk about life expectancy. So it's been a remarkable century where the life expectancy of hemophilia patients have increased significantly due to improvements in the treatment of how we treat hemophilia. So as you can imagine in the early 1900s, a severe hemophilia A would have a life expectancy only up to their teenage years due to un uncontrollable bleeding episodes. And then in the 1940s, um, yeah, life expectancy increased a bit more with the introduction of whole blood transfusion. And then in the 1960s, Dr. Poole discovered cryoprecipitate, which helped um, uh, treat our hemophilia patient and which then increased their lifespan a bit more. 
And then by the early 1990s, with the introduction of um, recombinant and plasma derived factor concentrate, their life expectancy for hemophilia patients who receive consistent factor concentrate almost reached a general population, which is about 10 years less than average. And today, a newborn baby born with hemophilia in a developed nation with adequate resources to factor concentrate is expected to reach a normal life expectancy. So th this life expectancy in general is, is likely reflecting the severe hemophilia A population. So what about life expectancy in a non-severe hemophilia A? So there's not much data on this, but I found one study um, that was published uh, last year that looked, um, this is a study from the Netherlands that looked at the life expectancy by disease severity over four time periods from 1973 to 2018. And so the life expectancy is shown on the Y axis here, and they have four study cohorts shown on the X axis here. And this upper black line here tells you um, the life expectancy of the general Dutch male population over time. And so you can see for the general male population in the, in the Netherlands, and for mild hemophilia A, which is um, the line in red, and then for moderate hemophilia A, which is the line in purple, the life expectancy is increasing over time. And just to point out in the cohort four, as up to, which is the last two decades, the median life expectancy for both mild and moderate hemophilia is about 80 years of age. So that's almost close to um, the general population. So this is all very encouraging data. Life expectancy is increasing before we're living longer, but it still remains a need for us to understand um, what is their mortality rate and what are their causes for death. So the issue with mortality studies is that there's no shortage of studies being published looking at mortality rates in, in different countries and in dif different diseases. But one of the challenges is um, trying to make sense of the different ways of how they present mortality studies. So firstly, a lot of them are using national registries and these national registries usually lack quality checks or have a very standardized reporting method or analysis. And so some studies you see that they, they report on the standardized mortality ratio, the SMR, which is an age-adjusted measure of excess risk in the study population when you compare it to the general population. And some studies look at mortality rate, which could be crude or age-adjusted depending on the population, which is just deaths per person years at risk. And then in the hemophilia population, most of the studies we have are conducted in developed countries. And we know that there are substantial differences in the health services and treatment provided um, across middle and lower income countries. And so can we really say that mortality rate is, is um, increasing overall if we're not looking at um, other countries as well? And lastly, for a lot of mortality studies, they pretty much report it based on overall population and they don't differentiate by disease severity, such as severe versus non-severe, or they look at other comorbidities. So patients with HIV, Hep C, or their treatment regimen, is it, were they on, on demand or were they on prophylaxis? And so taking all these challenges into consideration and, and the increase in life expectancy, what is the mortality rate in non-severe hemophilia A currently in, in, in this era? And so there was a systematic literature review conducted by Hay et al, which uh, citation is here, that found two studies published in the last decade, 2010 to 2020, that looked specifically only at non-severe hemophilia A, as shown in this table here. And in this Italian study by Tagliaferri, um, ranging from the last uh, 30 years, they found that the mortality rate was about 2.2 per 1,000 person in a mild hemophilia A, and 5.0 per 1,000 person year in the moderate hemophilia A. And then the Eckert study, which I'm gonna talk more about it later, this looked at um, hemophilia treatment centers from 10 European countries and Australia over 30 years. And they had about 2,700 non-severe hemophilia A patients. And they found that the mortality rate was about 2.3. And again, I show you the comparison with the severe hemophilia A population and their mortality rate is about 8.5. So given that there were only two studies looking at a non-severe hemophilia A population, we thought that it would be a good project to set up to determine what is the data like in the United States. And to do so, I used the Atten data set to answer this question. 
So the ATOM data set is maintained by the American Thrombosis and Hemostasis Network. This is a nonprofit organization and they developed this ATOM data set, which is a national database in the US, where they enroll persons with congenital bleeding disorders who have given their consent and authorized sharing of their demographic and clinical information for research. And then through partnership with hemophilia treatment centers nationwide, the ATOM data set started enrolling patients on January 1st, 2010, and they only enrolled um, alive patients. And as of now, there's almost 40,000 people with congenital bleeding disorders enrolled in this ATOM data set. It doesn't just include hemophilia, it also includes von Willebrand disease and platelet function disorders. And so this is, data set is a very rich and valuable resource when you're trying to study a subpopulation of a very rare disorder. So um, the objective of this study was to use the ATOM data set and looked over a nine year period from the uh, in, inception, uh, from the development of the ATOM data set so that we could set up to determine the mortality rates, the predictors of mortality and their primary causes of death in this patient population. And just to go through the statistical analysis, because I mentioned earlier how different mortality studies look at um, their method reporting differently. So in, in this study, we looked at mortality rate, which is 1,000 per person years, where we look at the number of deaths divided by the number of person years at risk. And then the person years at risk, because the ATOM data set only started on January 1st, 2010, that was the start of our observation period. Or if um, the, the persons enrolled were born later than that, we used that date of birth. And then the end of the observation period was December 31st, 2018. So this is the nine year, um, uh, time period we're looking at, or if the participant withdrew from the ATOM data set, redoing their consent or their death date. And then we look at predictors of mortality using Cox proportional hazards regression. So in, in this ATOM data set, they had 6,624 people with non-severe hemophilia A, and this was observed for a total of over 56,000 person years. What we found interesting was that about 86% were male and we had 14% female in this cohort. It's worth noting that the age distribution in the ATOM data set was skewed towards a younger population where about 40% were between the ages of zero to 19 years. And, and the numbers are actually much lower in the general population, which is only about 24%. So our cohort in the ATOM data set were much younger. And then some of the characteristics we show here is that um, Almost three quarters had had prior exposure to factor eight concentrate. About 70% uh, or one third are have moderate hemophilia. And then in terms of race, there were 83% white, 8% black, and about 18% Hispanic. So if we look at the mortality, we found that we had 136 deaths and it occurred at a median age of 63 years. And we calculated that the overall all-cause mortality rate was 2.4 per 1,000 person years, and the age-adjusted mortality rate is 3.3 per 1,000 person years. We decided to calculate the age-adjusted mortality because we discovered that the population was skewed towards a younger population, so we had to adjust it so that it was a fairable comparison. And then this table here just shows you what are the predictors of mortality. And so um, the risk of mortality increases twofold with each additional decade of age. Um, male had a 2.6 time risk of death compared to female. And then for hepatitis C, just having hepatitis C, whether treated or untreated, um, these patients had a two, twofold increase in risk of death. And if they had HIV, again, treated, their risk of death was also about almost fourfold compared to people without this condition. And then we then next look at causes of death. And so this just shows the causes of death for the 136 deaths that occurred among the 6,600 patients. And you can see here that malignancy was the most common cause of death at about 20%. And then we took one step further just to see what would be the standardized mortality ratio to compare it with the general population with these death rates. And we observed that the number of deaths from liver disease itself was five-fold higher than expected death rate, but the observed number of deaths for malignancy, for cardiovascular disease, and for accident trauma were lower than expected compared to the general US population. 
So some strengths to this study was this, this is so far the largest population of non-severe hemophilia A studied to date. And they were studied using a single uniform data collection tool, which is the ATOM data set. Additionally, this study, this US study looked at mortality rates for both males and females, whereas prior studies were only focused on males only. Uh, a major limitation of the study is that there is a survival cohort bias because the ATOM data set was only established in 2010. So the participants had to survive to 2010 to only be to be included and enrolled in the study, which could have led to underreported mortality rate. So if we take this study and add it back to the, the prior two studies that I've shown you, which is the Italian study, the European study, and now the US study, you can see that our, at least our all-cost mortality is pretty similar to other developed nations. To me, it'll be interesting to know what the results would be if we were looking at middle income and um, lower income countries where resources to hemophilia treatment is not so um, abundant, in abundance. Um, I mentioned briefly about the causes of death. So this here shows you a figure of the causes of death from um, more than 15 observational studies. And this looks at the causes of death in the overall hemophilia population. And you can see here on the figure, if you look at pre-2010, historically, the main cause of death in hemophilia patients has been hemorrhage, which is in um, dark pink, I would say or complications from HIV and hepatitis C, which is this um, very light blue color here. It's light green, sorry, light green here. And then of course, as we know, that was due to contaminated factor concentrates. But as our hemophilia patients are now surviving to an older age, the causes of death has now altered in a post 2010 era. And you can see that the death from non-hemophilia related, which is like cardiovascular diseases in blue here, middle blue here, the proportion is increasing in the post-2010 era. And then um, for like malignancy, it's also increasing as well. And these are two common comorbidities that are age-related. So these are the causes of death in overall hemophilia. So let's talk about the non-severe hemophilia A population. So, so far, there are only two large studies dedicated to the non-severe hemophilia A population. So the first is the INSIGHT study, which is the ACTED study. And just to briefly talk about it, it is a large retrospective cohort study of about 2,700 um, patients from 10 European countries in Australia, and they were observed over a 30-year period. And then the second study is the ATOM data set, which I presented earlier, that had 6,600 patients. And you can see that in both the INSIGHT study and the ATOM data set, malignancy was the most common cause of death, about 38 patients here and 27 patients here. And this is to be expected because, as we all know, age is a risk factor for malignancy. And then other major causes of death are the liver disease and cardiovascular disease. So, um, so those are the three most common causes of death. I just want to point out they also have hemophilia-related causes of death, and this is usually due to bleeding, such as intracranial hemorrhage. And so just to point out that despite their mild phenotype, they still, uh, non-severe hemophilia A patients still experience significant bleeding episodes that results in their death. And this highlights the mortality and the morbidity in this patient population and the need for us as clinicians working in hemophilia treatment centers to uh, undergo, for them to undergo active surveillance and monitoring so that we can address not just the hemophilia part of it, but also their other comorbidities that's associated with their hemophilia. So now we want to move on to talk about age-related comorbidities. So, you know, as, we, as I showed you earlier, these are the comorbidities that could affect the causes of death and as in turn affects the mortality rate. So I just want to share with you some work that I've done in inhibitor development and cardiovascular disease and risk factor as two of the major age-related comorbidities that are affecting the hemophilia population. But there are other factors as well, such as we mentioned earlier, malignancies, infection, liver disease, and renal disease. So in, in modern hemophilia care, um, inhibitor development, which is also known as uh, an allo antibody that is against factor concentrates, represents a very significant challenge in the treatment of hemophilia A. 
because when this occurs, the individual no longer responds to factor it concentrates, and they have very frequent and severe bleeding episodes. The risk of inhibitor development increases with the number of exposure days, and the number of exposure days is defined as any infusion of factor A within a 24-hour period. This is of concern in the severe hemophilia A population because this is the patients where they need prophylaxis factor from a very young age. And so this is a study here that looks at almost 600 hemophilia, severe hemophilia A patients that were born between 2000 and 2010, and they followed them for over 75 exposure days. And so the y-axis is cumulative incidence, the x-axis is the number of exposure days. And what they found when they follow these patients, if you follow this black line, the, the top line here, is that the lifetime risk of um, inhibitor development in a severe hemophilia A is about 30%. And the highest risk actually occurs between the first uh, 15 exposure days, as shown here. And in the study, they, they found that the median age of inhibitor development occurred at the 15 months and rarely occurs after 50 exposure days, as you can see the line all plateaus here. So it, it is a, the management of inhibitor and severe hemophilia A is usually managed by a pediatric colleague because this rarely occurs in adult um, patients. But what about the non-severe hemophilia A population? This is a, to me, it's a pretty hard question to answer because recall that in the non-severe hemophilia A, they require treatment infrequently unlike their severe cohort that is on prophylaxis treatment two to three times a week. And also depending on the factor levels, non-severe hemophilia A have a choice of using either desmopressin, which is a synthetic analog of vasopressin that increases your endogenous factor eight levels three, two to three fold over baseline. So the use of desmopressin has no, uh, will, will not lead to development of inhibitors or depending on their baseline factor eight level, some patients need factor eight concentrate, and then they have a risk of inhibitor development due to exposure to factor eight. As such, given their um, baseline properties, the cumulative incidence of inhibitors in non-severe hemophilia A is estimated to be much lower with a true estimate unknown due to heterogeneity of all the prior studies. So I mentioned the INSIGHT study earlier, if you recall the 2,700 patients from Europe and Australia. So they actually looked at inhibitor development in their cohort. And this is a figure that's been taken from their paper. And the graph here on the y-axis shows you the, the, um, the cumulative incidence of inhibitor development. And then on the x-axis here, it shows you the number of exposure days from zero to 200 days. And what we see that unlike the severe hemophilia A where the lifetime risk then plateaus, here you see that their lifetime risk of inhibitor development keeps on increasing um, up to, well, the plateau here because it didn't look that far, but it keeps on increasing with the number of exposure days. And so at 20 exposure days, the cumulative risk was about 3.5%. At 50 exposure days, it was about 6.7%. And then at 100 days, it was at 13.3%. So this was pretty much the first study to highlight the fact that in a non-severe hemophilia A population, inhibitor development occurred throughout their lifetime, and the risk continues to rise with increasing exposure days. And this is important to us because as the aging, as the non-severe hemophilia A population are um, living longer, they're going to be more susceptible to age-related comorbidities, such as cardiovascular disease, malignancies, um, surgeries. So these are all conditions that's going to require medical intervention and exposure to factor eight concentrate. Um, wanting to point out that they found that the median age of inhibitor development was about 46 years. So this is going to be an issue that we as adult, pro, uh, adult clinicians treating hemophilia A will need to help manage and learn more about. So once, once the inhibitors have been developed, uh, there's always a need to try and eradicate it and, so that the patients can uh, reuse, can be treated with factor eight concentrates again. And there have been randomized controlled trials and international guidelines from the World Federation Hemophilia and in Europe, which recommend that hemophilia patients with inhibitors should have access to immune tolerance induction therapy to eradicate the, the antibody against factor eight. 
And immune tolerance induction, or ITI for short, is basically uh, involving infusion of lactate concentrates on a regular basis, which can be daily to two to three times a week at very high doses from 50 units per kilogram to 200 units per kilogram. And it is the only proven strategy to achieve tolerance to factor A. And all these studies were conducted in a severe hemophilia A population. So how do we eradicate inhibitors in a non-severe hemophilia A when it develops? There's very limited data on this. There's, there's pretty much no randomized control trial and everyone treats them pretty much differently. So this figure here shows a survey of therapeutic options for inhibitor eradication in non-severe hemophilia A by clinicians practicing at hemophilia treatment centers in the United States. And the respondents to this survey were asked to choose what therapeutic options they would use for a non-severe hemophilia A patient with inhibitor who is asymptomatic, meaning that you discovered the, the inhibitor um, just by doing surveillance, but their patient has no bleeding symptom, or in, in black here, or uh, if they were symptomatic with bleeding episodes but had a low titer inhibitor, or if they had a bleeding symptoms and a high titer inhibitor in white here. And the options that the participants or the respondents could choose from were either observe the patient and avoid factored concentrates, observe and start ITI, immune tolerance induction, or um, a combination of both, um, other kind of immune like rituximab or methylprednisolone. So these options, the therapeutic options provided here were based on what had been used successfully in the literature. And so we kind of just used that as a starting point, but some of the respondents could list others as well of what they would use. And you can see here that with the black, gray, and white bar throughout the different treatment options, there was substantial variation in what people choose to use. And so this, this substantial heterogeneity probably reflects the conflicting success rates of these different therapy options, depending on which paper you choose to read, because they're all pretty much based on case reports and case studies. And as we know, they are, these kind of publications are very susceptible to publication bias. I do want to briefly mention rituximab here. It is off-label use, and it has been used for inhibitor eradication, and it's been documented in the literature since dating back to 2006 initially as case reports and then as a very small case series. And there's been relatively very good success with this. I will admit I am biased because when I was at UNC Chapel Hill doing my fellowship, I reported on nine consecutive non-severe hemophilia A patients with inhibitors. And we treated them with, a, with rituximab alone and had a 100% success rate. And then of this, um, two patients were rechallenged um, with uh, we talk, uh, sorry, they were challenged with factor eight. They did, they did develop inhibitors again, and then we eradicated it again with using rituximab alone. And as such, it has been my practice to use rituximab to eradicate inhibitors in this patient population. So as you can imagine, given the rarity of the condition, because there are so few patients in a non-severe hemophilia A who have inhibitors, it's going to be pretty impossible to uh, accrue sufficient number of patients to perform an adequately powered randomized control trial to look at the efficacy of the different treatment options. But you know this need can be addressed feasibly if we were able to conduct a multi-center registry-based observational study. And so using the two previous studies that we discussed earlier, which is the INSIGHT study and ADEN data set, we could see what has been done to look at treatment options for inhibitor eradication. And so with the INSIGHT study, um, they had 2,700 patients. And of this, they had 101 patients with inhibitors here. Um, they had 73 patients of the 101 that did not receive any eradication therapy. These patients were just observed. And then they had 28 patients who received eradication therapy. And not to go through the whole figure, but basically their key observation was that if the non-severe hemophilia A patient had a low titer inhibitor, you could just watch them because there was a high chance that it was going to spontaneously resolve where the inhibitor cleared on its own. Whereas if they had a high titer inhibitor, meaning that um, the Bethesda unit was, was pre, uh, greater than five Bethesda units per mil, then it would, be, uh, it would be wise to then use eradication therapy because the inhibitor was not going to uh, resolve on its own. 
So these are the data from the impact study. So what about data from the atom data set? And so in the atom data set out of 600 patients in the cohort, there was 171 patients with inhibitors and about 70%, 141 received no eradication therapy and 30 patients received eradication therapy. And this consisted mainly of immune tolerance induction, immunosuppressive therapy, and then ITI and immunosuppressive therapy. One limitation of the ATEN data set was that the data on outcomes of this treatment was not consistently reported. So we could not determine the success rate of this intervention. So overall, the data from the two large studies, the ATEN data set and the insight study showed that not all inhibitors in non-severe hemophilia A require eradication therapy because up to 70% of them may clear spontaneously. So the decision to initiate treatment and if so, which treatment should be individualized on a case-by-case -case basis. Regardless of whether inhibitors are cleared spontaneously or via eradication treatment, it's essentially determined that there's no amnestic response occurring when they are challenged with factor concentrates because this can affect their future hemostasis when they're undergoing trauma or surgical intervention. So given the challenges of inhibitor management, let's now talk about briefly about the risk factors because if we know what the risk factors are, maybe we can prevent inhibitor development in the first place. So one risk factor I talked about earlier was the number of exposure days, but other risk factors such as the factor eight variant, the family history, and ethnicity are, made, are known to be major risk factors for inhibitor development in the severe hemophilia A population. And then other more controversial, such as the product type, the intensity of treatment, and the age of first treatment um, is more controversial. And there are areas of research, um, and most of the research are in the severe hemophilia A population. So the studies looking at the role of factor variants um, causing inhibitor is much more limited in the non-severe hemophilia A. Again, when we come back to the insect study, they were the first large study that looked to identify high-risk patients based on their factor variant and emphasized the potential of using their genotyping data to estimate an individualized risk of inhibitor. So the insect study had about 1,100 white non-severe hemophilia A patients and they identified 19 variants out of the 214 factor eight recent variants that were found in this um, cohort. And what I want to point out here is that uh, the risk of inhibitor development at 20 exposure days for some of these variants are pretty high at one at 21% and one at 45%, which is pretty much comparable to the severe hemophilia population. And so even though this was the first study to look at this, this was a very homogeneous population. It was the white hemophilia, um, white population. And we know from prior studies that um, ethnicity can play a role in uh, increasing your risk of inhibitor development. And so we set out to look at um, the US study, which we wanted to look using our My Life, Our Future Research Repository. And this research repository is a US called collaboration where they provided um, funding for genotyping of hemophilia patients throughout the United States. And they currently have over 10,000 persons with hemophilia of all severity genotype and available for research with permission. And so we requested permission from the My Life of Future to look at what are the factor variants that were associated with inhibitor development in the non-severe hemophilia A population. And what we found was that in the My Life of Future, there was about 2,500 people with hemophilia, non-severe, Inhibitors developed in 77 of them, and we identified 46 factor variants that were associated with inhibitor development, and the majority was missense mutation. And these 46 variants were identified in a total of almost 900 people, um, including the 77 with inhibitors. To me, what was interesting was that um, in the insight study, which was a homogeneous white population, they had identified 19 factor missense variants, and of these 19, only five of them were found in our population in the United States. And so we had identified an additional 41 factor variants that were associated with inhibitor development. So the strength of this study using the My Life, Our Future, that it, it is the largest population of participants with genotyping data available to date. It consisted of a multi ethnic population. We had 7% Black, 3% Asian, and 18% Hispanic in this cohort. 
However, again, with, with registry data, um, they had no data on number of exposure days. So we could not calculate the cumulative inhibitor risk analysis based on factor variance, which the insight study was able to do. So that was quite unfortunate, but the data is the data. Um, and then if we look at other modifiable risk factors in non-severe hemophilia A, um, the other clinical risk factors is including intensive factor treatment, age, and surgical intervention. And so they do play a role as in its table here. So the first study by Dr. Kempton did a case control study of 36 inhibitor patients comparable to 62 non-inhibitor and found that intensive factor treatment which is treating with factor for more than six consecutive days was strongly associated with inhibitor development in those at least uh, 30 years of age and older. And then these two are from the INSIGHT study, which found which used nested case control studies and found that both surgical intervention and high doses of factor A also increased your risk of inhibitor development. Notably, just to point out here that they did not find increased risk of inhibitor in patients who, uh, uh, sorry, in depending on what recombinant factor it concentrates they use. So whether it was plasma derived or recombinant, there was no increased risk of inhibitor. So given all these risk factors and that there are currently no evidence-based strategies for inhibitor eradication and non-severe hemophilia A, it is more important to try and prevent this from happening. So if the patient has a high risk factor variant, we should try and use desmopressin whenever possible to mitigate the risk of inhibitor development. And then there's this very innovative approach that's been suggested where they use a combined approach of desmopressin and factor eight concentrate to try and reduce the intensity of factor eight usage. And then what I tell my patients nowadays is that they should keep a personal record of their factor eight exposure um, because when patients move um, from physicians or they move state, um, the, the number of exposure days they have is very limited. It's, it's not the records are not kept uh, accurately. And so I ask patients to keep it on their own so that they can share and we can see how much factor usage they've had over their lifetime. And then the last few minutes, I just want to talk briefly about cardiovascular diseases and its risk factor. So we know that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death globally in the general population. However, fortunately, multiple studies have reported that the mortality is lower in hemophilia than the general population, which is great. And they also have a lower than predicted incidence of cardiovascular disease. This table here shows the results of a prospective study of male patients with hemophilia who were seen in the Netherlands and the UK um, from 2009 to 2011, and they were followed for five years. And it shows you the expected cardiovascular disease events, the observed cardiovascular events. And what it says is that, and what it shows here is the relative risk of um, 0 0.33 and 0 0.38 in the severe and non-severe res uh, respectively, which suggests that even though hemophilia patients are protected against cardiovascular disease, the protection is less in the non-severe hemophilia population. <coughs> so despite the lower mortality and incidence from cardiovascular disease, multiple studies have shown that hemophilia patients have a significantly higher prevalence of cardiovascular disease risk factors such as hypertension. You can see here from three different countries, <coughs> from three different countries, the prevalence of hypertension was higher in hemophilia as compared in the general population. And then if you look at obesity as well, this is a meta-analysis showing you the pooled prevalence of overweight and obesity in hemophilia patients in the past eight years shown as a forest plot, and that most studies are geared in the developed countries like North America and Europe. And it shows you that the prevalence of overweight and obesity in hemophilia was about 51%. And for comparison, the WHO estimates that in the general population, only 40, well, not only, about 40% are overweight. So our hemophilia population are heavier than the general population. Um, this is a study I did in Utah, which tried to see if the prevalence of overweight obesity differed by disease severity. And you can see in the middle column here was that um, mild hemophilia were heavier, um, had a higher prevalence of overweight obesity as compared to the moderate and severe population. We also found that um, 
as the our, our cohort of patients in Utah uh, grew older, they also became heavier. And so to me as a clinician, this was particularly concerning because Utah is a relatively healthy state. It consistently ranks fifth on the bottom for obesity, like 46 out of 51. Um, the top healthiest state is Colorado. And so these findings highlighted a critical need for us to address um, overweight and obesity in our patient population. And we have now taken steps to hire a dietitian as part of our comprehensive care approach. So the, the management of cardiovascular uh, disease in hemophilia is very challenging in our, in our patient population because most of the management is going to involve antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulant or invasive procedures such as uh, PCI, cabbage, and cardiac ablation. The general rule is that we treat these patients similar to the general population with hemostatic modification. So in the acute setting, this is easy. We just give, we, we treat them with hemostatic, uh, we treat them with factor concentrate, ensure they, have ensure they have adequate clotting factor protection, and then we they can undergo PCI or cabbage or anything that's required. The problem is the long-term secondary prevention because the clotting factor level, what to target for in this patient population is unknown because they are going to require antiplatelet agents. And so what level should we target at without uh, increasing their risk of bleeding? And there have been a lot of studies being published, uh, multiple case series that report that antithrombotic therapy can be done safely in hemophilia patients. Um, and then there's also been studies showing that you can try and avoid long-term anticoagulation using uh, the left atrial appendix occlusion, such as the Watchman device or doing cardiac catheter ablation. I think from all these case series that's been reported, the data suggests that when you're trying to determine antithrombotic therapy for a person with hemophilia, whether severe or non-severe, we need to consider that individualized bleeding history. And pretty much expert consensus says that we try to maintain a factor level of greater than 20%, Although to me, this, this would depend whether they're using anti, uh, single antiplatelet agent, are they using dual antiplatelet agent or are they using anticoagulant therapy? To me, the, the considerable challenges is how do you maintain antithrombotic therapy in a non-severe hemophilia A population if they're going to require um, routine factor infusion to maintain a level greater than 20%. Because remember, our non-severe hemophilia A population are not used to self-infusion. They are not used to you know, infusing a factor product three times a week. And so there are logistic complications when you're trying to determine anti-traumatic therapy for these patients. So in summary, I hope that I've been able to present to you that the care and the management of the non-severe hemophilia A population is often overlooked, you know, both by patients themselves who sometimes skip their hemophilia care visits because they feel that they have a mild phenotype, they don't need much um, taken care of, and also by clinicians who have a, a misconceived notion that they have a low mortality and comorbidity. But then they do have considerable bleeding events, mortality and comorbidity. And as they age, their age rates and comorbidities are all increasing. The number of people with malignancy, cardiovascular disease is increasing. And all these are going to require treatment with factor replacement therapy. We showed you that in a non-severe hemophilia A patients, they have a lifetime risk of inhibitor development with increasing exposure to factor A. And so we need to apply preventive strategies to try and mitigate this risk. And finally, more research is needed in the management of these age-related comorbidities due to the complexities they are still learning from. For instance, what is the risk of benefit of anti-thrombotic therapy for cardiovascular disease in the hemophilia population, especially the non-severe hemophilia A population? What is the acceptable cutoff where we would allow the risk of bleeding versus the risk of clotting? And so in terms of acknowledgement, all this work and my training would not have been possible without um, mentors who have guided me throughout the whole way. And so um, when I did my residency at Mayo Clinic Rochester, I was mentored by Dr. Rajiv Prudhi. And then when I did my fellowship at UNC Chapel Hill, I was mentored by Dr. Nigel Key and Alice Ma and had the good fortune to be introduced to Dr. Kempton at the time who was at Emory University. And we've been working collaboratively since then. And some of the work they've done also would not be possible with support and resources from a few 
uh, foundation, which is firstly the ASH CRTI, which I uh, was very fortunate to be accepted in 2014. They helped me with my developing my clinical research skills and how to do a proper survey for clinicians. And then the work in mortality, infected variants, and inhibitor development was due to um, um, from the HTRS, the Hemostasis Thrombosis and Research Society, which gave me a one-year grant to look at this. And then the uh, Mental Research Award um, was a two-year grant to allow me to look at it. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm very open to questions right now. Thank you, Dr. Lim. That was fantastic. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll wait on questions. I did want to mention that next week there will be no grand rounds. They will return on March 16th with Dr. Carrie Anders from Duke University, who will be presenting treatment of breast cancer, brain metastases, and evolving landscape. To view all upcoming Winship Grand Round lectures, please visit the Grand Round page on the Winship Cancer Center website or Winship calendar. Uh, so let's see. Um, there's questions that have come up. We do have one question from Dr. Tran. Um, he says, great talk. Um, because of the potentially milder phenotype, what are strategies uh, that you use at your center to help retain and encourage them to come back for their regular visits and therefore get captured in databases um, if any comorbidities arise? So ever since the INSIGHT study came out with the data on a lifetime risk of inhibitor development in a non-severe hemophilia A population, I have actually shared that with my uh, non-severe hemophilia A population. I share with them, like, for instance, in a severe hemophilia A, what is their lifetime risk? And a non-severe hemophilia A, what is their lifetime risk? And so somehow that uh, gave them the, the, the conception that, yes, I have mild hemophilia A, but maybe it's not as mild as what I was told since I was a child. So that's one way I try to get them to come back for their return visits on an annual basis. It doesn't work all the time, but it does for some patients who are um, very... Um, conscientious about their health, they do come back because they want to know what is the latest data on, on, on this patient population. And so I think a lot of it is patient education, counseling, and keeping them updated on what's, what's going on right now that, look, yes, you were always told you were mild, great that you haven't had much issues, but as we learn about you, um, as time goes on, as you're getting older, um, we are learning a lot more from you, and then we're sharing with you back the data. And so that has kind of inspired some of our patients to come back. Of course, there are some patients who say, you know what, I'm good. See you whenever I need you. Yes, yeah, for sure. Great. Um, here's another question from Dr. Frank. Wonderful seminar. Can you expand on potential reasons for increased mortality among males? Does this persist after controlling for hepatitis C uh, virus status? Um, so are we, I'm not sure, Dr. Frank, are we talking about non-severe hemophilia A population specifically? Um, if yes, it could be, to me, I feel that a lot of the, especially now with hepatitis C state, um, being able to be cured from it, what I've seen in a lot of my patients is that once the hepatitis C is cured, they don't really get follow up anymore after that from hepatologists, um, especially if they don't have any signs of cirrhosis at this time. But we do know that just because you're cured from hepatitis C, it doesn't mean that your risk is completely uh, resolved. And so even though they didn't follow up with hepatology, I still follow them up. I don't do the ultrasound, but we do check you know, comprehensive metabolic panel um, on them. Um, in terms of increased mortality, I also think that the data we have is still pre-era uh, pre of, of the treatment for hepatitis C. So I think if we look at 2020 to 2030 or 2020 to 2040, we might see that the mortality risk actually goes down. I just think that the time capture that we have on the time period for both the insect study, which was 1980 to 2010, and the Ethan data set, which is 2010 to 2018, we're not capturing the cohort right now to look at the mortality adequately. I think this will change because now they're getting treated. Great. So I have a question for you. Um, has your approach to inhibitor management and your non-severe patients changed um, given the availability now of amicizumab? which can reduce the bleeding complications? 
Um, I haven't had that situation come up yet, um, but I will say that I still want to try and eradicate the inhibitor as much as possible, especially if you're having a lot of bleeding symptoms, because my concern is, yes, we can treat with emicizumab, we can prevent bleeding, but what, I, what am I going to do in the future if they're going to need major surgery? I think that's an area of good research, and we can work on that, Dr. Kempton. Yeah, great. One um, additional question. I have a lot more we can talk about later as well, but one um, maybe comment of interest is um, the mechanism by which patients with hemophilia may be at higher risk for hypertension. Can you comment on what your understanding is of that? And we've observed it as well. Hypertension is quite common in our population. We try to be aggressive about it given the risk for intracranial hemorrhage. Um, but why do you think that's, why do you think we're seeing that? So uh, there's probably biological reasons for that, which I'm not gonna go into. But to me, one reason I found is that a lot of our patients, because they're seeing us once a year, they don't see a primary care provider. They feel like I'm already seeing my hemophilia doctor and she pretty much helps me with everything. And so they, they don't see a primary care who's gonna be more actively involved in, in making sure that you know, their diabetes is well, that, that to screen them for diabetes, screen them for hypertension, screen them for obesity. So that's the patient's conception that, okay, I've already seen a doctor every year. She's gonna take care of me every, all the time. And mm -hmm. I will say that as a, as a clinician, I'm more interested in the hemophilia and so I will say that I do sometimes miss the slight hypertension that's seen in clinic or the, and sometimes I don't check for screening glucose. And so I feel like it needs to be a partnership between two, uh, both the primary care provider and the hemophilia physician to make sure that both hemophilia and non-hemophilia related comorbidities are well taken care of. It's been speculated, um, especially in the severe hemophilia A population, that the, the higher risk of hypertension could be due to the other comorbidities like HIV and Hep C in the past, um, but I don't think anyone has really found a good reason why yet. Great. Well, I think if we don't have any additional questions, uh, we can close out our session. It was a, a great talk and um, wanna thank the audience also for their participation uh, this morning. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Thank you so much for having me.